So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our next panel, which is uh, 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 a policy panel, if you like, uh, that we are going to discuss the question of financial innovation. I'll just give you a quick philosophy behind putting this panel uh, together, which at this point is quite easy to do, given the set of papers that you have already seen and some that you are going to see coming, coming next. So if you think about the design of uh, uh, the financial system, uh, Adair already mentioned the paper by Townsend, but there is this broad set of papers in the theoretical literature that argues that given the informational and the moral hazard problems in the, in, in the economy, debt as a financial contract turns out to be the optimal contract because it is not sensitive or as sensitive to informational asymmetries between the borrower and the lender. It also has this nice feature that you put all of the residual risk uh, on the shoulders of the borrower who is then forced to do the best he or she can with the money they have borrowed. So because of those nice properties, debt turns out to be the optimal contract in, 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 in that setup. Now contrast this result with, with another strand of literature in microeconomics, which, is, which makes a very different argument. And it says that if you have a principal agent model, uh, and one of them has a higher ability to absorb risk, so is risk neutral, let's say, as opposed to the other agent who is more risk averse, then it is optimal for the risk neutral individual to absorb all of the risk, right? Now, that's in a way is the opposite prediction because typically the lenders are the banks who are much higher ability to absorb and diversify risk as opposed to an individual agent uh, who is uh, taking on the loan. And that logic would suggest that you, know, you want to put, uh, you, you want to give the risk to the, uh, to the, to the lender. Now add to this mix, mix all of this recent literature that argues that there's actually a macro externality to this risk sharing question. And in particular, if you impose too much of the losses on the borrower at, at a same point in time, um, the whole economy might tank. So this is the financial accelerator model where uh, uh, if you impose losses on the banking sector, they get into trouble and the investment breaks down, or my own work uh, uh, suggests that if you put those losses on the household balance sheet, the aggregate demand falls. So this brings me to the policy panel, which is from a practical regulatory perspective. One, you know, there is this trade-off, there is this practical tension. Adair has already talked about that. How do we balance this tension between the optimality of debt at a micro level uh, from the agency and, in, uh, and informational issues versus the fact that we want to have more risk sharing in the economy from a macro prudential perspective. Um, what we are going to do is we are going to talk about different debt markets with this sort of broad question in mind. We'll start off with um, uh, uh, Chris Nielsen, who's a professor here at Princeton, um, and uh, uh, Miguel Palacios, who is at the Owen School of Management, they are going to talk about uh, some work that they have done in the student debt market. Then we are going to go into the mortgage market, and Susan Wachter from uh, Wharton, she will uh, talk about uh, innovation uh, or potential innovations in, 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 in that market. And finally, we'll end with Ashoka Modi, who's going to talk about the sovereign debt market. So again, hopefully, uh, I've tried to give you an overview of why thinking about this issue is, is, is important, and then we'll talk about some of the practical uh, issues that, that rise in connection with this. So let me uh, start by uh, uh, requesting uh, uh, Miguel Palacios to talk uh, about student debt, and then, as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll follow the sequence I suggested. So uh, today I'm, I'm wearing kind of two hats. On one hand, I uh, am a professor of finance at, at Vanderbilt. Uh, I do research on asset pricing and human capital. But on the other hand, before going to the PhD and becoming an academic, I was very interested on in creating claims on future income. And I'm co-founder of the company that has been doing this for, long, for the longest, uh, I think, in the world. So I'm, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, two things from a practitioner and an academic perspective. So uh, what is income-based funding? So let, let's start, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about 
uh, two types of instruments that you might have heard about. One of them is called income contingent loans. Uh, under an income contingent loan, students pay a percentage of their income for some time. Uh, now there's a balance, there's interest, and the rules of the contract is just you pay a percentage of your income until your balance is zero. Or if you spent a lot of time and you really had low income, at the very end there's some low income forgiveness. There's a second type of income contingent contract, uh, which uh, we're calling more recently income share agreements. Uh, this contract is more like a claim on future income. So uh, the graduate pays a percentage of income for some period of time, regardless of how much that ends up being. Right? So if uh, this graduate has low income for many years, uh, payments are going to be low. If this graduate makes a lot of money, uh, payments are going to be uh, very high. Now, why do these matter? Atif hinted at this uh, in the introduction, but uh, let me provide some quantities, or, or at least a, uh, an example that can suggest how large this problem of, say, burdening students uh, with risk, with the risk of, of, of studying uh, amounts to. So take a very simple uh, process for labor income. Um, this is a process that has transitory components and a permanent component. So uh, yt is the log labor income. It has some starting value. Uh, xt is the permanent component, and epsilon t is the transitory component. The permanent and the transitory components have associated some, uh, some volatilities. And let's say uh, that we have people valuing their future income uh, with a standard CRRA utility. Um, in basically, no nothing weird here. The only, the only simplifying assumption here is that uh, the agent is going to consume everything. So the labor income is the only source uh, of consumption. So if we calibrate this model from data, uh, in this case, PSID, so this is US data, US panel data, uh, you get that the magnitudes of these shocks, the transitory shocks are 0.23, uh, permanent shocks are 0.14, and then we can ask ourselves, how much does it cost to people to carry uh, these shocks, this uncertainty? Uh, in their value function. So in this table, in the first row, uh, I have a measure of center T equivalent loss. So the, the, what this is telling us is the certainty equivalent relative to the initial income. Uh, and so if we look at the, uh, I'm going to focus on the second column that would be with a risk aversion coefficient of five, which is, would be very standard in the macrofinance literature. Uh, what that point 88 is saying is that carrying transitory shocks has basically a 12% cost uh, for, for someone. Someone would be indifferent of taking a 12% cut in their income and having no transitory shocks. Uh, that might be, sound relatively modest, and it is. The second line uh, measures the cost from the permanent shocks. So this is where things really matter. And so since these shocks move, become larger over time because they're permanent, um, the, a, a nice way to think about them is relative to the growth rates in income that someone is receiving. And so what that second line is showing is what is the growth rate cost of having these permanent shocks. And so what that 0 0.05 is telling us is that someone would be indifferent between reducing their growth in their income by 5% in exchange of having no uh, permanent shocks. Now, that's huge. That's basically saying people would be indifferent between having roughly no growth in their labor income and taking away the riskiness uh, than having the growth that we typically observe uh, in the US. Now, we do a certainty equivalent measure for the whole thing. Uh, we need some assumptions of how long uh, agents uh, look at these things. Uh, so let's assume that they're thinking of 40 years. So this is a young graduate. Uh, and let's say that they have a low discount of uh, so 1%. Uh, the certainty equivalent loss from carrying uncertainty in their labor income is 60%. So an agent would take a more than half cut in their starting income to take away uncertainty uh, from their future labor income, and they would be indifferent. This is a huge number, right? This is, the, this is the headline number. Of course, this is highly dependent on the assumption that you make about risk aversion. So if you think that someone has log utility, which would be 
uh, the case of uh, a risk aversion of one, the numbers are much smaller. Yeah, so uh, this talk is not for you if you think that people have a uh, log utility. Now, the, the central point is that when we ask students to fund their education with loans, we're exacerbating the problem. Right? They, this, they, said they already have a bad problem, we're making it worse. And that's because, of course, loans uh, induce leverage. Okay, so another second argument for why income-based repayment would be a good idea, besides the insurance that it would provide, uh, is one le much less explored in the literature has to do with the information that claims on people's future income would reveal about uh, quality of education, about the value of pursuing one degree versus another. That's one part. And the second one is uh, it would, these claims would provide an incentive to help students in a way that, uh, an incentive that today does not exist, right? So education uh, is almost by definition a jump into the unknown from the point of view of the student. Mentoring can have a large impact, and with loans, there's really very little incentive to help that student. That could be corrected with, uh, with uh, income contingent, or so with claims on future income. Okay, so that's the basic argument. This idea uh, has been floating around for uh, basically 60 years. Uh, the first formal statement of it that I know of was made by Milton Friedman. Uh, back in 1955, and it created some discussion uh, at the policy level for the design of a federal student funding program. It didn't go anywhere, and so it was ditched. Uh, it was ditched. Now, incidentally, Muhammad Ali financed his boxing career with one of these contracts. So this has been going on uh, for a while, and, and those investors did quite well. That happened in 1960. Now, the idea eventually was picked up, as far as I can tell, uh, by James Tobin at Yale, and he was instrumental on creating what was known as the Yale Tuition Postponement Program, uh, which was an income contingent loan. So the idea of, of the future claims on income disappeared. It became just an income contingent loan. Uh, and this uh, lasted for about nine years. Eventually, it was ditched. Yale claims because the federal funding program came in, not because there was a major flaw uh, with, uh, with the design, or at least the, f the major flaw that showed up 20, wars, 20 years later uh, had not made itself present. Uh, several pe famous people took that program. One of them was uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, and then kind of the, the idea died. It emerged after a student of James Tobin picked it up in Australia. And so uh, this student, who's, uh, uh, whose name is Bruce Chapman, uh, designed what is considered today the best income contingent program uh, for students. It's a nationwide program. It's called HEX. And very shortly, this was 1989, very shortly afterwards, several countries followed. So New Zealand was the first follower. Chile followed behind New Zealand. And the US followed uh, relatively soon in 1993. And then this kind of idea became very prevalent. So the number of countries that today have some kind of income contingent funding for their students at the national level run by governments is relatively large. After these developments, a bunch of private initiatives came in to pick up on the original idea of, of creating claims on future income. And so everything that I have uh, listed on this slide after uh, after the U.S., so from 1995 on, are private initiatives. These are firms that have been, or that, that started doing these contracts uh, with, uh, with students. So I'm co-founder of Lumni, which is the third there. Uh, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about Lumni, because it's the only one that survives still on, uh, on, on, on this field. Uh, so it's, uh, most of the funding is done in Latin America. It started with a Chilean fund. Uh, it then moved to Colombia, the U.S., Mexico, Peru. Uh, to date, has financed about 8,000 students with contracts that resemble claims on future income. Uh, this typical funding is uh, for two or three years uh, with a five-year repayment. That's relatively short. I know that uh, has to do with uh, 
finance market constraints in these in this, in this countries. And students typically commit something around 14% of their income. Uh, the size is uh, about $50 million in funds, so yes, this is a drop in the bucket. Uh, hopefully it will continue growing. And uh, the returns, which I think is the reason why it will continue growing, have been quite attractive. So between 8 and 14% uh, in, uh, in the places where we have done that. This is the for-profit funds. There are several non-profit funds which have different objectives, uh, which are target at 0%, so they're sustainable, but they fund students that would not typically be funded uh, in a for-profit endeavor. So one of them uh, focuses on ex guerrillas in Colombia and has been very successful in achieving something that we would think is good from a social perspective, that is preventing these ex-military fighters to do bad things and instead to stay in school uh, training for something else. Okay, now when, when an economist hears about this idea, the first two things that come to mind typically is this is clearly not possible. There's huge agency costs involved. Uh, of course, there's asymmetric information, so you're going to get only the dots and the, the, uh, the people who see in themselves making a lot of money in the future are never going to show up. And the second problem would be moral hazard. So once you find someone this way, they're going to run away. So the same way we think about it, the entrepreneur uh, in the corporate literature is the way we would think about the student or, or these answers we think about the student. Now, clearly, there is an issue of funding someone who has lots of knowledge about their market value. Uh, but that's not the case of students, at least not in my experience. It was definitely not me when I was uh, choosing what to study. And consumer advocates will typically say they will be worried that the investor is the one who has much more information. And I think that worry is right. Investors have much more information than young students. 40-something, uh, I'm not sure. Now, on the moral hazard issue, clearly there's a problem with short-term contracts. Right? So, you get uh, someone who goes, clerks from some Supreme Court justice, uh, makes nothing, pays nothing to the investor, and then uh, starts a private practice, that would be a problem. Uh, these issues are greatly reduced with longer uh, term contracts. So if moral hazard and adverse selection have not been the issue, the natural question would be, uh, what's the issue? And, and so here's, here's uh, what we found in Lumni at least at the scale that we have now. Agency costs have not been the problem. Maybe they are the problem when one moves into millions of students. Uh, but if you think about this verifiability of income in a world in which we have a solid tax uh, authority that is collecting taxes based on income really doesn't apply to students. It would apply in places where there's no tax authority collecting of an income. And it might apply to entrepreneurs who have idiosyncratic ways of, of hiding how much their firms are worth. But for the vast majority of the population, the assumption that you cannot track someone's income, at least in the United States, is actually not right. You can verify income, at least to the level that someone is willing to hide income from the, from the tax authorities. What's the problem? There's legal ambiguity. So everywhere that... Uh, I've tried to do this, there's been a huge legal challenge. And uh, this legal challenge creates a problem because whoever wants to do this in mass uh, needs to commit so large, makes a, needs to make a large investment to figure out the legal way. But this is not patentable. Uh, anyone who comes afterwards is going to free ride on on this knowledge. And as a result, there's a reluctance to be the first one to invest uh, in large ways. That's the reason why I think we don't observe these markets uh, on a large scale. The main issue is enforceability, of course. That is, will a judge accept uh, the idea to, I have two more slides, and I'll be done. Uh, will a judge collect, uh, force the student to pay uh, from their future earnings? There's minor issues like the applicability of usury laws, which is not that minor, say in Colombia, where you will do jail time if you're found to be usurious. Uh, and there's taxation and, and uh, issues about who is going to regulate you. The big one is enforceability. So looking forward, 
Uh, there are current legislative initiatives that would take care of this. And so uh, Rubio has made it part of his campaign. And I think that's good and bad. It's good because it brings the issue to, to the attention of legisl legislation. It's bad uh, because it can become a political issue and then nothing might happen. Purdue University is launching one of these funds for their own students. And the number of entrants is growing. That's after the timeline. There's been some uh, new firms that are showing some interest. And they're creating a track record, which eventually uh, would be the one that will define whether this grows as an asset class or not. So uh, what's the role for policy here? Making the rules clear would be a huge benefit for at least experimenting on seeing whether these contracts work or not. Thanks, Adi. Well, thank you for the invitation to come uh, talk about uh, higher education. It's my favorite topic, so I talk about that all day to anybody who will listen. So you guys get to listen about this now. The first thing I want to start out with is my best friend in high school uh, growing up in Chile. Uh, we went to a fancy private school, but his father died when he was very young, and he had a scholarship at the school because it was a Catholic school. And then when he went to college, he had no money, so he couldn't go to, there were no loans at the time in Chile. And he uh, basically got a, a Lumni loan, and now he's a successful entrepreneur. Uh, he also hates Lumni because he takes so much of his money. Uh, I, I tried to give that feedback. I don't know if that uh, helps at all. Um, so I'm going to take a step back a little bit. I'm going to start with a little bit of a big picture uh, and then go into some practical things that I've studied and some practical policies. Um, so higher education, financing of higher education and the market in general um, is super important. It's not super hard to argue for that. Um, and governments all over the world participate in, uh, in those markets. They either provide the service uh, directly by having universities running them, or they provide subsidies, they give grants, or they um, provide financing so they could provide loans. So they're actively participating in this market all over the world. And, um, and, but the details of how they do this actually um, are quite different in different places. They might adopt things at different times. And what we're learning from the, from the empirical literature is that these details matter a lot for choices of market participants. So in particular, there's a lot of work looking at how people make choices, decide whether to go to college or not. They might be, be, not have uh, access because of financing. Maybe the, the, the way you provide uh, subsidies could shift people from studying one type of career instead of another, and then therefore change their whole kind of life uh, ahead of them. There's programs that try to bring in people, for example, into areas that might have more externalities that we might think, like say, good teachers, so we need to somehow convince young, talented people to come into teaching. There's all kinds of examples of this thing. The, the what I wanted to just kind of highlight is that the details of how the, the, the financing of higher education um, are set up um, many times are kind of out, you know, written out in an arbitrary way sometimes, but that they matter a lot for choices. And they matter for the, not only the choices of students deciding what to do and where to go, but they also affect, through the consumer side, they affect the supply side. So they affect what kind of institutions are going to offer higher education, how much they invest in the different types of things that they'll provide. And these can, these, all these things together um, are very important, not just for uh, well, the easiest thing as you could think of for welfare. You would think it matters a lot for the country. Um, but it also matters uh, for costs. The cost of financing these systems can matter a great deal. And I think my, from my experience in general, these things are designed with almost no knowledge of what these things cost. So I'll give an example. It's close to home. You could think of the way we subsidize higher education in the United States is very similar to other countries that I study. You might provide a subsidized interest rate and I'll provide a loan and the government might back that loan. And it's the same across all students. You might wonder, well, why is it that, that that's the right price and the, the right subsidy for different types of students studying different types of things in different types of institutions? You might think that potentially the reason why we have this is that there's a missing financial market. Mm -hmm. So the government might go in there and try to help but there's also an externality. We might think some things provide externalities. We, we want people to go to college. But not everything uh, provides the same externality. So right now, we're, we just kind of do this in a flat way. It's not very uh, potentially, it's not the efficient way of doing it. And 
you could think that it might be possible to do it. You want to collect data that any, if you, had a, if you look at this as a portfolio um, that the government has of a bunch of bonds that he loans money out to people and they might pay you back or they might not. Um, and uh, you might decide how you could achieve the same amount of people going to college by allocating the funds in different ways. Right now, we basically depend on the students. They get to decide what to do, and they decide where to go. And the supply side, universities will provide whatever people want to do. And when they graduate, their job is done. Of course, when they can't pay back their loans, it's uh, quite awful because you can't bankrupt it away. Uh, and then the government doesn't get the money back, and they also hate the government. So these, uh, uh, I think these, these issues are very important. and. Um, kind of the, the small details of the design of these loan contracts are really important and can have profound effects on the supply. As an example, I, I, can, I can talk about Chile, which has seen in a, a crazy, you know, unprecedented expansion of higher education in the last 10, 15 years. The amount of people going to college more than doubled in a decade. Um, in the middle of the decade, uh, they provided government-backed student loans, just like in the United States. And before that, you, there weren't very many options. And the, su the supply side expanded super fast. You have, you just imagine the logistics of building enough buildings and infrastructure to just house half a million people in a couple of years. And so the private sector goes in there really fast. And the one, one year after the student loan program was, was there, half of the student loans were captured by the typical uh, universities that we hear about here in the United States, like uh, University of Phoenix, that's uh, uh, Kaplan. There's, there's, Universities that, that that's their business model here in the United States, and they, they, it's good and bad. It's not. I'm not saying I don't want to make the impression that this is a bad thing. You want people to go to college. You need somebody to go in and invest. You now you've solved this problem of financing potentially, and these these kids want to go to college now, and somebody goes and provides that service. That's a good thing, but the details of how you did it, what kind of things they provide, who do they let in, what interest are they paying, how many of those guys are going to pay us back, all that is done basically driving blind here in this case. You're flying with no information about these things. So um, the, in, the, in, the, in the previous government in, in, in Chile, I worked very closely with, um, uh, together with some colleagues, we worked closely with the government to try to do this in a little bit more informed way. There's the first thing that was, we could already see a lot of people weren't being able to pay back their loans. This loan program started in 2006. And by 2010, it was already apparent that maybe some people wouldn't be able to pay this back. This is going to be a looming problem eventually, very similar to the, the, the discussions here in the United States. Um, and so we, what we decided to do is, well, let's calculate what the, what the cost of this portfolio is right now. How many of these guys are going to pay us back over the next 10, 20 years? And how, you know, what can we do to improve this? So the first step is to get data. So data is key for this. And so... We, uh, luckily in Chile, everybody who ever goes to college basically takes a test and they publish these, they publish these scores and where you went to college in, in the newspaper. And so we went back and got all the newspapers from the 70s onward for the entire, everyone who went to college in the country, digitalized it, sent it to India, India came back, took it to the IRS, linked it onto everybody's earnings today, and then we basically calculated the earnings profile for every career every college and it conditional on their test scores and their gender and their high school and everything you could come up with. And you find a lot of heterogeneity. There's things that on average we're financing and we're loaning the money and we know on average they're not going to be able to pay us back. And at that point there's almost an ethical concern. That's we're, we give the guy a loan and we don't let him bankrupt it away. But we know from the data that he's not going to be able to pay us back in expectation. So it's not even like the right thing to do at that point. Uh, so that's uh, the first step we, th we thought, well, you know, I was you know, thinking the best thing I can do here, what the mo most politically feasible thing is maybe if consumers were more informed about these things, they would make better choices. I mean, nobody's parents went to college. Why would they be super informed about the differences between uh, majors potentially? So we use this data. We developed a, an online platform and had all this data there. And when, since we were working with the government, when, the, when you sign up, for a student loan, you have to fill out, say, a FOSFA here in the United States. In Chile, it's called the FUAS, almost the same. And uh, when you fill that out, we just ask them, half of the kids randomly, what do you want to study? And then they write down three things. And well, how much do you think you're going to make on those things? And they say, or how much do you think people today make? Uh, something we can check in the data. And um, 
Well, we tell them how much people actually make in the data, and then we suggest things to them, just like uh, Netflix might suggest something to you when you're watching a movie. We say, well, you like art history, you might be interested in graphic design, which has only 50% unemployment and not 90% unemployment. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, I like to have everybody go do, you know, something that's great and make a lot of money, but you, it's only valuable if they're actually gonna switch their choice. So we do this and we do it in an experimental way over across 50,000 people, and we find that people do switch. Um, their careers. We saved that cohort $70 million, if you believe the estimates that we had. However, it's still a small proportion of what they're doing, uh, because you can only shift people at the margin. They're 18, they, they, they developed uh, basically uh, an idea of what they want to do with their lives, and it's hard to switch everybody into the most lucrative things, and in fact, we might not want to do that. And so the second thing we, we said, okay, we're not solving this market, these inefficiencies in this market by informing consumers, it seems. Um, at least with this policy, maybe what we can do um, is do some supply side regulation. So we said the loans are capped at a certain amount that's determined by costs, basically. They look at how much a career costs, and so we loan you that amount. That's the max you can get a loan for. So these caps are basically you know, price caps. If, if college was free, there'd be like reimbursement rates. So where do those come from? They come from previous costs, and that's, you, you might think that, that it's, it's kind of silly. Um, uh, especially if that leads people to get loans that are more than they are going to be able to pay back. So what we, we did, we, um, we did this with, well, this actually became a paper we co-authored with the Minister of Education. It's in the AER last year in the Papers and Proceedings, and the Minister of Education was, is an economist, so he thought it was cool to be on the paper. I don't think he, he's read it yet, but, <laughs> but, um, but the thing is, he, he, had, he, was, he was really open, he had um, some pretty good ideas. Basically what we said, we said, look, we want to send a signal to the supply side, don't provide things that you know, aren't gonna have a private return on loans. If they have a scholarship and they can do it, great, but these are two different reasons we're financing. One is a missing mark, financial market, and another is an externality, we want them guy to do it for, no matter what. But we're doing it with the same instrument, with a subsidized loan. And that's where the inefficiency kind of starts. And so we say, well, let's just cap the loan at the present discounted value of what we expect to get back from this guy's uh, studying here seems to be a normal, pretty rational thing to do if you're a, a lender. You don't want to lend people more than you expect to get back. Um, and that show, we, we show that the, the current rates that we're loaning are way off in some fields. And there's not that many surprises. Any, everything you wouldn't tell your 18-year-old your son who's going to college, you'd tell him, you know, yeah, I don't know about that career. Th those turn out to actually not be great. So it's, uh, it's no, there's not that many surprises, but the order of magnitude of the differences are quite, are quite surprising in some cases. And so what we do is we, we, we cap these loans, and the hope is that as uh, students uh, see, uh, see the amount that they have to pay out of pocket above the loan, maybe they have to go to Lumni and get the extra money to go to sync because they really love it, um, they, might, they are still able to do that, but at the same time, we're sending a signal to the supply side, don't provide this thing. If it's very cheap to do, fine, do it. But if it's expensive and then nobody makes any money on it, let's not loan, you, loan kids a lot of money to go do that. So, a similar thing was proposed here in the United States is gainful employment. The Obama administration tried to do a discrete version of this, which is if nobody gets a job, then we just cut off all financing for a college. Um, they tried to do that. The problem is that without a lot of data, it's, very, it's kind of arbitrary. What, what's the number, 40% unemployment? These guys might have been in jail. Now they have, you know, they're unemployed, but they're not in jail. That's pretty good. And so it's kind of without good data, you can't really do this. Um, and so our, our version of this is a continuous uh, version where you basically just, you let the guy loan, take out a loan as much as we expect he's gonna pay back, and you force the political discussion to say, well, he can't do it anymore. He can't study poetry. Is that, we don't, is it, well, well the reason we want a guy to be a poet isn't because he's gonna make a lot of money, it's because we, we like it for other reasons. And so, well, let's give him a scholarship. Why we give him a loan? And that will force a discussion on how many of those we want and then we can have an informed discussion of, of cost. So, I mean, I, I mean, I'm working on this. There's a lot of details in the, in the financial structure of these loans, the way you do it. There's lots of examples like Lumni and others. There's all kinds of different ways of doing this. I, I think that more uh, people need to study the details and how they matter for general equilibrium outcomes. And um, I hope to be able to come back, report back in a few years with more, with more, more results and more positive results. Thank you. Thank you, Atif.
for the extraordinary conference that you have pulled together today and for the outline of uh, this panel and for inviting me to participate on this panel. Uh, a chief outline this panel is, uh, in fact, the whole day is uh, the paradox of debt, where our micro models point to optimality through household choice and firms' um, supply, but then the macro externality of too much of a good thing, as uh, Lord Adair Turner uh, says in his Debt and, and the Devil. Um, so which is it? Uh, I think that um, I am on this panel in part because I have, even though I'm uh, by day a professor, uh, I actually do have a financial innovation that I invented. I hasten to add it's a failure, so I am clearly stable and thankful for being a professor. But the, uh, uh, with my colleague, Andre Pavlov, also a professor, so clearly what's wrong with this? How could this not fail? A, a true non-recourse mortgage loan. Uh, we mostly did it out of um, curiosity of, could we describe such a loan? And um, would there be takers, any takers crazy enough to take it on? And the answer is no. Uh, but what is such a loan and what, why is it of interest? And under what kind of circumstances would it actually uh, be a part of a market? Uh, so the concept of a true non-recourse mortgage loan is to avoid uh, the the problem that Atif uh, outlined, which is uh, after a mortgage crisis, losses are so large that the whole system would tank but for bailouts. In a true non-recourse mortgage up front, the lenders would be on the hook or the, the insuring firm that would be on the hook for clearly uh, absorbing the losses and the borrowers would have no loss. Uh, 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 after a short sale, their home would be, their mortgage would be extinguished by the value of the home, so there would be uh, no adverse consequence for their borrowing thereafter, and therefore they could go on and consume, which is individually, of course, a good thing, but for the point of this conference, it's uh, macro stabilizing because they could consume, and the impact of not uh, of co the consumer losses, of course, is where the debt overhang is a significant problem. <clears throat> I'll talk more about this if you'd like, and uh, it's patent, et cetera, and, and it's described in a paper which I can make available. But I thought what I, I would do, and of course this, this is not the only such instrument out there. Uh, Atif him, himself has a shared risk mortgage, and uh, Bob Schiller has a, a, an instrument that, that has similar uh, aspects. We can talk more about these. But it seems to me that the, the ultimate problem with any of these instruments is that who bails out uh, in case it doesn't work and the, the, uh, the entities who are providing. And as the market is today, I do think that that is a serious risk. Um, I don't think we've solved our problems. I think today's lecture, uh, today's papers are extraordinary because I think they tell us where we are exactly in our understanding of the problems. Uh, across in, in many different directions. Surprisingly, uh, up until um, uh, the luncheon speaker, uh, mortgages weren't mentioned. Uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to be the only one today to talk about mortgages. Uh, but then, of course, it, as it turns out, the uh, luncheon speaker, the key problem that he's speaking about is uh, the debt that should have no name, the uh, debt of which the bad debt is real estate. So. Um, let me start here, uh, because his uh, book, an extraordinary book, I actually read it last night, and uh, well, I'm going to buy another one, but um, so it's not just on the, it was, it was riveting. I actually stayed up late, finished the entire book. It was a riveting book. It's really fantastic in many, many ways, but not only uh, for, in, 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 for what he talked about today, but about what he talked about today, his conclusion. Uh, and if I may, I, I, you know, I, I, I apologize for, for boulderizing it. But in, the conclusion basically comes to a movement back to before what uh, Richard Herring and I call, uh, excuse me, Richard Green and I call the housing finance revolution. Uh, so the housing finance revolution occurred across the world in the 1980s and 1990s, and housing finance from being segmented and allocated became integrated into global capital markets. 
uh, uh, argue with paper with Richard Herring that the problem, the, the consequential problem of this is that real estate is an incomplete market. There are, despite the problems we hear and we understand about short selling the overall market, there are at least you could short sell ETFs, you can short sell stocks, you cannot sell individual real estate housing. 90% of, of our real estate value is in individual homes. Yes, of course, there are REITs, a very small percentage of value. So what do you do? Real estate is incomplete. Housing asset prices cannot be short sold. And this becomes consequential with the leverage of the housing finance system, which after the housing finance revolution is absolutely within the banking system itself and integrated capital flows across the world. So um, the financial accelerator, which um, uh, we've had some reference to earlier, uh, led to not just the crisis, the subprime crisis, obviously, but the 1997 Asian financial crisis, uh, the simultaneous crisis, which we see here, of a bubble in uh, UK, Ireland, and Spain. These were bank-led. Um, in the paper in the JMCB recently, I talk about, yes, it was credit that was expanded behind these three crises as well, although not mortgage-backed securities, but rather covered bonds. Credit bubbles propagate asset bubbles. So in the US, up until 2007, the, uh, this is a picture of GNP versus different kinds of debt. And you can see government debt was really benign. You can see corporate debt benign. You see financial uh, companies' debt uh, in 2000 increasing rapidly, as was uh, household debt. And by the way, that household debt increase was entirely in mortgages. Actually, credit was decreasing net. Um, and this debt was mispriced. So the debt was mispriced, um, uh, and it's non-recourse debt. So uh, in the US, uh, and effectively in other countries, it is still recourse, but of course recourse with impact on, over the overall, uh, the overall economy, because uh, households, consumers then consume less with the debt overhang. So short-term lenders who are, let's say, risk-loving relative to others, they find it rational to extend risky loans without an adequate interest rate spread. These loans are NPV negative at origination. Uh, we saw in this crisis that mortgage underwriting standards uh, decreased, and I'm going to go through these slides very quickly, dramatically over time. Credit supply increased um, dramatically during this uh, period of the of the pro of the just for a mortgage um, subprime and then non-prime more generally. But to me, this is the key slide. This is the slide which shows that the pricing, the spread for risk with the volume, this is the volume of spread. So the um, pricing of risk dropped. Uh, about 300 basis points. Um, uh, this is, uh, I think I have the triple uh, B here, uh, but the triple, I'm not sure if it's triple A or triple B. The triple B, of course. Uh, this is the spreads of um, private label securitization uh, as, as uh, measured off of a um, database of um, all uh, that we can get our hands on MPS. So why is it in this period when clearly risk is going up as we could see by these um, terms, why is it that the pricing of the risk is going down? Um, we look at a predictor of this, uh, and simply the uh, several predictors. One is simply the share of non-prime to overall lending, and we see the uh, does extremely good job of predicting prices. So I asked this question to my students yesterday, and they said, "Duh, of course." The reason is obvious, um, but then they only got 50% of it, which made me feel good that I at least asked the question, that of course when you reduce credit constraints, you're going to increase housing prices because you're going to have more demand. But of also, of course, as you decrease the pricing of credit, the option adjusted spread, which we just saw, also you are going to increase the housing prices almost automatically. So the question is, the macro pru question, uh, ahead of us is, what do we do? And this is what we did do. So this is in January 2008. This is the option adjusted spread of agency MBS. So uh, starting in uh, 1996, uh, so agency MBS has 
historically no default risk. It only has prepayment risk. So it trades um, once you know the option adjusted spread. And this is the option for prepayment, not the default option, but the prepayment option. So if you, and, and this is the spread with 10 year treasuries. So if you look at the spread of uh, agency MBS with 10 year US Treasury debt, it is uh, entirely explained by optionality models, prepayment optionality models, with the exception of this January 2008 spike, which came about when uh, Anecdotally, we are told there were some heated conversations among some folks from China with some folks in Washington, D.C., saying, are you or are you not going to back the agency MBS? And at that point, the response was QE1 and then QE2 and QE3, where indeed uh, purchases of agency MBS assured that the interest rate would drop and remain at 150, 100, 150 basis points, which was the historical spread to 10 years treasuries. So what's the point? The point is um, that, in a sense, what we had done between 2000 and 2007, when we produced about $3 trillion worth of private level mortgage-backed securities, was to lend out the implicit federal government guarantee to private originators of MBS at standards which were not overseen by, uh, by regulators. So the wrong kind of debt, it seems to me, the critical question is, the wrong kind of, cre of debt is uh, not the, only the question of the wrong kind of debt issued by banks, but the wrong kind of debt issued by shadow banks because we're all in it together. So the joint liability that Jeremy Bulow spoke about is a joint liability that the banking system, because of the correlation with housing prices across the board, is exposed to along with other lenders. So I'm going to um, end with just one more uh, slide, which is Jeremy's slide. And um, Jeremy's slide, uh, I think, points to uh, both the problem and the potential solution. Uh, and the potential solution of financial innovation, it seems to me, is not to go back to the um, pre-financial revolution where we have a separate uh, uh, segmented allocation of capital to real estate. I don't think we can go back even if we wish to go back. But rather, we need to improve our pricing of risk in real estate. And we've got to do this both for regulators and for the market. Let me hold off on the market side for a moment. But it seems to me that while it's clear, and I think it's, uh, we've had presentations today, and certainly Lord Adair's presentation, which point to the absolute necessity of not only relying on monetary policy, and not only fiscal policy, but as a part of fiscal stability policy, having prudential, macroprudential policy. But when the time comes to raise that loan, to lower that loan to value ratio, when the time comes to lower that loan to value ratio or lower that loan to income ratio, where is the authority intellectually to know at what level we must lower it to? How do we know the answer to that question? Once we know the answer to that question, then we will also be able to know and predict what the impact of credit levels that are in the market are impacting future prices. And once we know that, then we ought to be able to have pricing instruments that are created that we can short sell to complete the real estate market. And that's the innovation that I'm looking for, bringing markets into regulation, as I, I think uh, Jeremy's uh, innovation of ERNs does. Thank you very much. This is our task. Appreciate it. So my, my talk is, thank you very much, Ati, uh, related to two themes that you've heard before. Uh, first is the, the uh, claim that Atif and Amir have made that debt should become more like equity. 
And the second is building off the ERN model that Jeremy Bueller presented. How can we adapt that to the sovereign debt um, uh, issue? And so my, my basic claim is that sovereign debt is actually equity. So it, 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 sovereign debt is called debt, but is really equity. But it has over time created, uh, has been given an overlay of debt-like features, which has made it from what it should be a flexible instrument to a very rigid instrument. So in fact, in Atif Schemata, where we should move from debt to equity, we have moved from equity to debt and created innumerable problems, which have then uh, very wide-ranging financial stability implications. And the, the creation of, 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 of equity to debt, I, I call it the Geithner Doctrine. Uh, I call it the Geithner Doctrine because there is a widely held view that there should be no default on debt uh, in the midst of a crisis, which is the only time you really want default on debt, and to make it equity-like. And so, as, the, this, as this great recession has evolved, there has been a greater recognition that the Geithner Doctrine does not work, but there, the, the, the interests that surround uh, sovereign debt are such that they have coalesced back into a, 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 a flurry of words, which basically leaves us essentially where we were, and therefore a contractual arrangement where debt is issued as a contract that already has equity-like features rather than being at the whim of a regulatory political process uh, in terms of the restructuring is where I then take it to an ERN-like structure. So for, for many of you, this is, this is very, uh, the, you, you know this and it's very straightforward, but I, so I've basically, um, you know, uh, Larry Summers said that uh, in, in academia, plagiarism is a sin, but in policy making, it's a virtue. And so in, in, in that spirit, I basically just uh, cut and paste uh, from, from uh, people whose names you recognize over here, uh, which is that because so, in the case of a sovereign, the debt is the residual claim. And so because it is the residual claim, there's nothing beyond debt. So once, you've, once your revenues and, and expenditures are in, the residual claim is the debt. And if, if, you're, if your revenues are insufficient, then you have to default on the debt. And there was an old fashioned way of doing it. So, so I, like, I like this quote uh, from uh, John Cochran, which says, you know, it looks and walks like a duck, uh, like debt, but it really is equity. And the attempts to try to make what is inherently a, should be a flexible contract and should be in the nature of a contingent contract creates all kinds of, of uh, perverse outcomes. So it used to be fashionable at one point to say, well, because sovereigns are likely to inflate away their debt, uh, you want them to issue dollar-denominated debt. And so that, that then, then ties their hands in a way that prevents them from, from defaulting. And Chris Sims wrote a very, very nice, a very elegant paper saying it really doesn't do anything. In fact, it increases instability because this notion that somehow the average cost of borrowing declines 
is completely wrong because what happens is that maybe you pay less on the dollar denominated debt but then you because the residual claim becomes all your local currency debt you just have to pay more on that so that the average average uh, uh, interest you pay on your debt does not change but you do create a rigidity which which then creates instability so dollarization looks attractive initially but then when you realize that it is ultimately there is some there has to be some residual claim somewhere in the system and so you're just going to throw throw the instability uh, to that so uh, as sims concludes giving up the option of partial default as a fiscal shock absorber is, is a costly option to give up from a public policy point of view. Okay. And so that, that then leads to the notion of contingent sovereign debt. So that because it's, it's a residual claim, if you are going to issue it as a debt claim, then you should have it as, uh, as a contingent debt instrument. Okay, there, there are two other related uh, literatures which, which basically come to the same conclusion. Uh, one is the notion which is in the sovereign debt literature, which you know, people like Jeremy Bueller know well, is this notion of exclus uh, excusable debt. Excusable debt is the idea that once it is known that a sovereign can in fact not honor all the claims, then it is in the self-interest of both the creditor and the debtor to, to have a settlement, which, which recognizes the reality that the debt will not be paid. So excusable debt is the notion that exposed, it is in everybody's incentive to, to come to a bargain. But because you have this contractual system, there is, a, there is an incentive also to hold out and so there is something of a of a dilemma at that point when it is in everybody's interest, but there are some who would like to hold out, and that creates uh, the disorderliness and the delays which create the instability. There's similar literature uh, uh, with the theme of neglected risks that you cannot write a contract which which ha which accounts for all possible risks. And so again, you need flexibility. In the context of this paper, they use the, the example of money market funds, the idea that breaking the buck is somehow a terrible idea, uh, should not really be a terrible idea because there, there are neglected risks and you want to have the option of, of uh, being allowed to break the buck. So, so a, there is a sort of strong prima facie case that sovereign debt in particular, because of its residual claim nature, should be equity-like. So what is the practice? Oh, sorry, so the, the, historically, it has been, <coughs> it had the, the nature of sovereign debt as contingent. Um, uh, has in fact been used widely and so uh, I just give quick uh, some quick examples, uh, but uh, uh, Michael Bordeaux here in, in the gold standard system, uh, there was this notion of contingent uh, repayments, <clears throat> and so the notion of contingent repayments, use of inflation as default, uh, negotiated and sort of a, a friendly arrangements between creditors and debtors, recognizing this is a sort of a long historical tradition which has only recently been broken by <clears throat> what I am uh, uh, calling the Geithner Doctrine, which emerges sometime uh, around the Mexican uh, crisis. And this notion that somehow if there is a default on, on sovereign debt, uh, Geithner says that there will be cascading defaults. So this is the, the threat of contagion and meltdown and civilization as we know coming to an end because a sovereign defaults on its debt. And a lot of what, of what Geithner says over here, fear of cascading defaults, really is sort of made up. Uh, and, and he asserts it as, 
as a historical fact that there are there have been cascading defaults. And to the best of my knowledge, if you look at the examples he gives of East Asia or of, of Latin America, I don't know of cascading defaults. Uh, and that, but the point is that because this notion that there will be cascading defaults fills the environment and the sort of G7 meetings at the time, everybody comes to believe and, and persuade themselves that there will be cascading defaults. And so people like Trichet and Geithner, who are otherwise completely at odds on every ideological issue, come together and say, no default in the midst of a crisis. And so these are quotes from Geithner's books where he says, after Lehman, he lost all tolerance for the idea that you could have default in the midst of a crisis. But because you then create that presumption that there will be no default, then everybody comes to believe and act on that basis. And so if there is a default, then at that point, there is a mini crisis. So, yeah. so the, the, the point of, of this exercise is to say you have to break that cycle where everybody is persuaded that that's the only way to, to handle things. Mm. So since uh, Atif is, uh, yeah, so the rigid contract, look, uh, everybody knows the Greece story. The rigid contracts create Greece, essentially. Because you say you can't default because the civilization will come to an end. And so in May of 2011, the IMF was forecasting that the Greek economy will contra contract at 3.5% that year. Just that year, Greece contracted by 9%. So, and, and over, the next, uh, over the next six, seven years, Greece went into a basically a Great Depression because the notion that Greece could not be allowed to default and, and, and use that as a fiscal shock absorber was considered completely uh, unreasonable. So anyhow, uh, the, the, the policy process then continues to work in this way which reinforces this view because uh, the policymakers get caught in a loop. Two minutes. So uh, this is a this is a complicated chart, and so because I have two minutes, I'm not going to to tell you. But it's a really nice story, which is that at the start, it, about about a year ago, the IMF said, "This is not this is terrible. We need to do something about it." So there was a recognition, and these are two proposals uh, differing by eight months, and. If I, if I had the time, I would like to walk you through how, at the end, that little red box over there has completely destroyed the meaning and purpose of a proposal that was made in, in April 2015. In January 2016, we are basically back in, in practice to where we, would, we were at the time of Greece. So, it, the, the, my my, my, my uh, suggestion and, and proposal is that a sovereign debt contract will be written very much in the spirit of an ERN. It will say at the time the sovereign debt is issued that if a certain spread exceeds a certain threshold, there will be a standstill on the payment. So there's no, there's no equity in a sovereign's case. So we, we cannot have recourse, as in the Bulow case, to payment with, with a piece of equity. So the equity over here is that there will be a standstill on the payment. To compensate for that, presumably the lender will charge a higher uh, interest rate when the, when the contract is, is made. That's a good thing in my view, because right now the lender is basically using the implicit guarantee that he or she will be repaid uh, through some kind of a public mechanism. And so the implicit guarantee is not being priced and now will in fact be priced. And those who are going to bear the risk will, uh, will actually be asked on to bear that risk when the time comes. This will cushion the shock, it will cushion the fiscal shock at the time of distress by, by stopping the payments during that period of time. When it is cured, 
then the uh, repayments begin uh, on the schedule that, that was originally proposed. This is a, a, my adaptation of the ERN. Uh, it has some features of, of the uh, calomeris herring in terms of smoothing out how the triggers work, uh, but this is where I think the world should go. Uh, this is a cute slide, so I can't resist showing it. Uh, the, the word, the phrase floating exchange rates did not exist in common usage till about the late 1940s. And it really takes off with Milton Friedman's paper on flexible exchange rates. And this is from Google, uh, Google's engrams. And I think we are at a point where debt itself the idea that debt becomes a flexible instrument and, and contingent instruments, I think something like that is likely to happen in the next 50 years. It will be a slow process and frustrating, like many of my panelists have said. Uh, this is a very quick one on mortgage. Um, so there's this, been, this idea, this search for the perfect, the ideal LTV or LTI, um, there's this idea also that if you implement LTV six periods before you want to see the impact of it, you actually see the effect of it. Um, I guess that's more of a question, mortgage related, like what do you think is the ideal LTV um, and at what period and what, at what point in time should a country implement such a measure? Uh, that's an excellent question. Of course, it's time variant that's the problem. Uh, and uh, it depends on uh, housing prices uh, themselves. So um, if, in fact, there has been an exogenous shock uh, at that point um, uh, going forward, uh, the economy would presumably be less resilient. You might wish to adjust it. But on the other hand, there has been uh, proposals out there for automatic changes in LTV and LTI. And I, I prefer uh, it being non-discretionary. The problem with it being non-discretionary at this point is we simply don't have the models to answer your question. We do not know the uh, direct impact of LTI, LTV on house prices, that, that endogeneity, which is uh, depending on supply elasticity of real estate itself and the timing of that. So if, if you, um, just to quickly uh, go to an example, uh, if you raised uh, Canada two days ago, uh, re uh, reduced their, uh, their equity requirement, increased their equity requirement from 5% to 10%. Uh, presumably that is going to have an impact that is immediate, but it, over time housing prices themselves will adjust and so there is a, that time adjustment factor has to be part of the original model. Uh, but I think there's no alternative than to create these models because, you know, how, uh, how does Canada decide to go from a 5% to a 10%? Maybe it should be much, much higher. And only half facetious question for anybody who wants to answer it. It was observed that the basic theme of this conference is equity is good and debt is bad. Does that reflect the hunger on people's part for a Sharia-based financial system? <laughs> we'll take one more question to dilute that one. <laughs> Professor Modi, about the, the sovereign cocos, um, how, if at all, does the recent experience with the, the stresses around and the discussion around the, the Deutsche Bank COCOs um, inform uh, your views or the, the, uh, the profession's views on how COCOs would best be, be formed, how the market would react, what, what needs to be in place? Yeah, so uh, uh, I think that's a very, very interesting question. I think there's a two-part answer to that. Uh, I think part one is that the market is still learning. I think there were some lazy investors who invested in these cocos, and they've suddenly panicked for reasons that I don't think are necessarily valid. And the second part is that if you move to something like an ERN type structure, which is less 
draconian and is therefore more gradual, uh, which is where I hope we will go and which will be then more market-based. I think that's the transition that will occur. So, so I view the, all these, so I, a long time ago, I, 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 I worked briefly in the catastrophic risk market. And at, at that time, it was considered completely outlandish. In fact, what people used to say to us that for ex when you send insuring satellite uh, uh, launches used to be a hugely expensive business. And now it, it's, it's a routine business. So I think we are at a stage where we are shifting from debt-like to contingent instruments. And so we are going to have a number of setbacks like that. But I think we are still moving in the right direction direction. Um, any other question? We are yeah. almost at the end of it. Yeah, Marisha. In your presentation, you were highlight, highlighting some of the problems of uh, bonds being indexed to GDP. Yes. It, what about bonds being indexed to commodity prices? especially with the disacceleration of China and, and, and the collapse in, in global commodity prices, that's putting a lot of stress in many governments of uh, emerging market countries that export commodities. So do you think that's a feasible type of bonds to issue? And if the answer is yes, why do you think it has not been issued before? Yeah, Thank you. So, so uh, the, when, when this, this idea about contingent debt, in terms of just the, the historical scholarship, came up about 30 years ago when we had the Latin American debt crisis. And at that time, in fact, people like Paul Krugman and others had written about it. And I think what happens with, so commodity prices is, is technically better than GDP because it, it is, at least we have some reason to think it's exogenous and can be measured. But the problem is that the correlation with debt servicing capability is still very low. Now it may be in some in, in in Chile's case it is very high, and so maybe in that particular instance it is fine. But as a general solution, it's it's a harder solution. So it may be a very specific con sovereign for which it works, but not as a more general solution. Okay, can I just and we'll end on that since I'm in charge here. Um, <laughs> just just to confirm on this GDP linked um, question, if I understood you correctly. As long as governments are only issuing in their local currency, there's no problem with what we have. Is, is that? Yeah, if they're, if they're issuing in their local currency, there's no problem. But you see, again, the, the problem arises. So Greece is, is uh, issuing in its local currency. Now, you might say it doesn't have monetary policy. No, no, no not, not like Greece. Like if you truly have your own currency that you have control over. So Greece, obviously, is not in OK, in fine. So I, I, even then, the question will arise. Yeah. So if you can inflate away your debt, then there's no problem. That's what yeah. I mean. So that's basically the situation. Yeah, fine. Thank you very much.